Hey, it's Tim here. I'm finally back out of surgery treatment. The stitches are gone and Gartner have dropped the 2023 business quadrant for analytics today. In this video, we're going to go through it and I think they've even added a little bit of spice related to Tableau. As ever, let's get stuck in. So every year, Gartner released something called the Business Quadrant for Analytics. It's essentially their analysis of how all the tools in the analytics and business intelligence space are essentially performing compared against each other. And um, it was actually released on, if I go to the very top of the actual report, I put links to both of these in the description so you can go to them uh, yourself and enjoy them. Um, this was published on the 5th of April, 2023, but I think that is the first publish um, today, Tableau released a blog post about it. So I feel like there's some sort of embargo where people who uh, maybe pay for the report and, you know, you know, input into the report, get early access to it. And everyone else uh, and the companies, the technology companies are allowed to communicate what's happened in the report a few days later. If it happened on the 5th of April, I completely missed it. And for that, I'm sorry. Um, but nonetheless, it's here. And uh, Tableau have done a, a blog post, as they always do. For the 11th time in a row, they've made it as a leader in the in the Magic Quadrant. What's interesting here is they've not... They've not added the image and in previous years they've actually added the image and those have uh, you know coincidentally been the years where tableau's performed better in terms of being uh, more of a leader um, with more of a vision and more of an ability to execute um, than its competitors but in this year um, it's just a blog post from Francois and Pedro talking about essentially summarizing you know the big commitments they're making to the future with Tableau and uh, also being sort of grateful for their customers and how that's performed even though it's been a very sort of tough environment generally in the economy um, and then more generally they've sort of I think kind of responded to maybe some of the things they're doing to kind of, uh, you know, combat some of the critiques from the Gartner Magic Quadrant uh, here on the bottom of the blog post. But we'll come to that a little later. What I want to do is focus in on the report itself. So if I just move my little uh, divider here to the left, and this is the Magic Quadrant. It's really quite simple. What I will do is I'll just go straight to this, which is the image that Gartner create. Now, I have to say, <laughs> for a Magic Quadrant in the analytics space, this is possibly the worst chart because the axis has no real meaningful numerical description so um i think in response to that critique at the very bottom of the report is a breakdown of how they arrive at their scores for the ability to execute and the completeness of vision i'll go to that a little later on but um the 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 meat of the matter here is that you can see that salesforce now called Salesforce, not previously Tableau. They've put Tableau in, in brackets, but what that means is next year, that, that would just be Salesforce, um, is now here. Now, it's interesting because a few years ago in this uh, quadrant, if I just sort of zoom into this a little bit more, uh, I don't want to get into trouble for having this on the screen, so I want to keep the Gartner logo and everything on the page. Um, in previous years, this quadrant was dominated by products. And by that, I mean... Um, you didn't see the big technology companies in here, if at all. Uh, you know, Microsoft wasn't in there. Google wasn't in there. Salesforce wasn't in there. All the tools that were in there were basically on their own, a bit like Click, SAP, uh, uh, Oracle, ThoughtSpot. You know, these are all individual tools with no big sort of parent owner. What is interesting is that uh, this year it's just Microsoft, not Power BI. Um, it's just Salesforce and it's just Google. And next year they'll they'll get rid of that Tableau in brackets because I think they'll speak to the whole Salesforce platform, including Tableau as well. And so that is a super interesting sort of trend over time. But nonetheless, hey, the results are here. It looks like uh, Gartner have rated Microsoft a lot higher uh, in terms of both ability to execute and completeness of vision. Now I'll come to that in a second. Um, and it's interesting to sort of understand how, how do they arrive at this score? How do they sort of make this up? And you can see they have um, a bunch of different sort of things that they use to kind of um, evaluate and the things they measure against and these are sort of put into some sort of blender of course we don't we don't get sort of any perspective on what goes into that blender but if i then go to the very bottom this report is so weird because it's it's sort of structured in the in the wrong way um because the things you actually want to know about so the evaluation criteria this is right at the bottom in my opinion this should be at the top i don't know why this is at the bottom but anyway the evaluation criteria is here and then they break that down into the different sort of weightings for each one so ultimately they have um these sort of um score areas and the ability to execute is weighted differently to the uh, completeness of vision okay and so these these things are sort of giving it a score um on a on a, some sort of scale and so because these 
these um, criteria are different for both of them. You can kind of think of them as each having maybe a score out of 10, and then there's a weighting applied to that to sort of give certain areas um, a little bit more prominence based on their market research and what they're doing. And that derives a score. They don't give us that score because unfortunately, if they gave us that score, um, you could sort of reverse engineer this whole report and then go out and do it yourself. And they probably have some sort of proprietary uh, IP in the background that's way more statistically driven and research driven. They are a research organization after all. And that's what uh, drives the score. So that is hopefully a brief explanation of how they arrive at this uh, chart with no, <laughs> with no numbers on the axis. And uh, I have to be honest, in past years, um, I've actually not been too bothered about this quadrant because I've always felt that um, Gartner have, have in some years completely missed the pulse on what people who use the tool day in, day out actually experience. And what is interesting about this year's report is I think it's actually the most accurate it's been in a long while, both in both in strengths and in weaknesses, uh, or cautions they call them. <laughs> they don't use weaknesses. I don't think any company would sign up to being uh, you know, called out for their weaknesses, but they call them cautions. And I think the way you've had to read the cautions in the past are, look, if you're trying to make a decision about this piece of software, then these are the things to look out for, and these are the things to challenge Tableau on. But the strengths have normally been sort of very positive things, things that you can look out for. And um, yeah, you can go ahead and read the whole report. I'm not going to go through and read it word for word. Um, the main thing is this chart. And then the, the most important thing, the thing I do in this report is I actually just go and find the word Tableau. And the reason I do this is because I want to see every other place where Tableau is referenced versus another product. And it's always interesting to see this. And um, so you can see here that, um, you know, it's Tableau's reference multiple times, uh, you know, in other in other softwares. And it's always interesting to just go and read those comments. That's what I recommend you do. Um, you could read this whole thing and it's a 64 minute read according to Gartner. But in the, in the world today, surely this is a podcast episode. Surely there's a there's an AI model that's already read this out. I don't know why Gartner just had a text model. I'd love I'd love a tool. There's a there's a tool called Speechify which could probably read this for you uh, faster. In fact, for several years, the magic quadrant for analytic and business intelligence platforms has emphasized visual self service for end users, augmented by AI to deliver automated insights. Now. The great thing about this, if I go to Tableau, let's just go all the way down, Salesforce Tableau, here you go. Obviously, Tableau gets mentioned a lot in the Tableau section. If I just move this, um, separate it out a bit more. Um, so here we are. Um, this is the section for uh, Tableau. And, you know, it's quite short, actually. Um, for a lot of research that takes quite a lot of time, there's not much about each of the tools. And so it really sort of speaks to this comparison against other tools. And the people who are reading this, probably don't have the kind of time to read as much as I would want to read about the product. But here are the strengths, um, and uh, it's actually quite nice to see. Tableau as a skill. Now, I can I can very confidently say that I see Tableau in job descriptions. I see uh, Tableau, the skill, being referenced in so many different places. And it very has reached that level of market dominance in terms of requirement and job, job descriptions, in terms of demand for skills. Um, the very fact I was able to launch a course on LinkedIn Learning, which has already reached 10,000 learners. I have a YouTube channel that reaches 47,000 people every single month. It's definitely a skill that's in demand. Uh, and so it's interesting to see Gartner recognize this as a strength. Essentially what they're saying to you know everyday uh, companies who are thinking of using the product, hey, there's a good market of people out there who have the skill in using this tool. You can ask for it and you can expect them to have support, not just you know from Tableau itself, but it specifically references its community here. And that's really, really important. You know, People like myself, people like other Tableau visionaries, uh, Tableau ambassadors, and pretty much everyone else who's talking about the product, whether or not they're recognizing the program, is contributing the, to this massive pool of knowledge and expertise. And so that makes it easier for companies to adopt the tool. Agnostic and flexible position. So although acquired by Salesforce, Tableau remains a more cloud data source and agnostic uh, choice. So what this is really saying is that, look, even though Salesforce has acquired Tableau, um, you know, the tool has remained uh, fairly agnostic. I, you know, Tableau haven't ripped out connectors for Google, connectors for uh, Microsoft Azure. All these connectors are actually being added. SharePoint is getting features. And so it remains an agnostic tool, even though it has a parent owner that is in probably competition with some of its competitors as well. Although that's that's an interesting point we'll come to because you can see here there's another point which is a caution which says Salesforce centric innovation. So 
In terms of where it is today, it's agnostic, but there's a caution later on we'll cover, which talks about the innovation being essentially Salesforce-centric. Um, analytics experience. The proprietary VizQL engine sits at the center of the entire analytics workflow of Tableau, providing an optimal visual analytic experience. The user-centric product improves the multi-persona collaboration within the tool, expanding the adoption of the tool by more business users. I literally have no idea what that paragraph meant. Um, I don't know what VizQL has to do with any of all of that. Um, it feels like, um, you know, a bit of Tableau marketing has got into Gartner there and uh, they, they needed a way of sort of pinning Tableau's excellence to some sort of IP. Um, I'd actually say Tableau's intellectual property and research and, um, you know, capabilities goes well beyond VizQL and well beyond some of the core capabilities um, that they're just mentioning here. Um, and yeah, you know, some of the best parts of the platform are places where they're allowing people to ca collaborate. So this multi-persona collaboration, this concept is actually fairly, fairly concise, but I don't know how they've managed to piece together a paragraph. Maybe ChatGPT wrote that paragraph, who knows? <laughs> But then let's go to cautions. Um, market momentum and support concerns. Now, this is super interesting. I, I have to say this up front, at least for as long as I remember. I've never read the cautions part of the Gartner report and felt that it's been a very real reflection of concerns that I've seen in comments in my videos, um, in the community, and in discussions at user groups and various other places like I, I don't know what happened at Ghana this year in terms of Tableau, but they nailed it in terms of the cautions, okay? So let's let's look at them. Market momentum and support concerns. While it's still showing uh, strong market momentum, a Tableau's had slower revenue growth recently. It's basically, it's been a tough economic market, and um, it maybe speaks to why this is a little later when we look at the Microsoft section, which I'll touch on briefly. Uh, clients are sharing concerns about recent layoffs at Salesforce. Uh, also, timelines of some support functions continue to be an issue, particularly for standard support customers. So for those people who are buying the product and getting standard support, i.e. not paying for premium support, they're seeing their timelines for getting a response to support tickets slow down. I've seen this in so many instances. I can't really talk about those instances, but nonetheless, th this can be validated both on Twitter, on Tableau forums, People are just running to new places. And it's sort of interesting because this has also created a sort of um, an interesting effect where in the community, we're actually just getting on and helping ourselves. We're finding these bugs, sharing them with people. Newsletters are popping up. New channels are popping up because this support is just not coming from the vendor. And it's kind of, it's really good to see it sort of reflected here. And um, I'd be interested to see sort of a more formal response to that problem, especially seeing as now it's been called out. Um, and there is this sort of small uh, message here about um, customers feeling they're being pushed to premium support to get their um, you know, get their issues heard and to ref to receive what they consider adequate, so sort of standard level support. So that's an interesting thing. Again, I can't speak to the exact instances, but I think if you use Tableau um, and you've had to send a support ticket about something really complex that needs maybe a level two or level three support, then you'll you'll know exactly what I mean. Um, Salesforce-centric innovation. Some of Tableau's emerging capabilities, including CRM analytics and data cloud, are designed to integrate with Salesforce. Some clients have expressed concerns about not getting the most of the combined platform if they don't move to Salesforce. Alternatively, they'll need to spend extra to get the capabilities that belong to other product clients. So what this is really speaking to is two things. First of all, Salesforce have purchased Tableau. Um, in various contexts, Salesforce executives keep reiterating how much a, of a premium purchase Tableau was. And I always, I always, in the back of my mind, I always sort of listen to that and I sort of think they're saying the Tableau is expensive and they need to kind of get the value that they paid for out of it. That's what I hear in the back of my head when they say it was a premium purchase, okay? And so what is interesting about this is that you know, customers are feeling like the direction of travel for the innovation is towards Salesforce. And if you don't use Salesforce, it feels like you're not gonna get the value from this. And so um, some customers are worried that they're gonna have to start putting their data in Salesforce to be able to realize the full value of the Tableau platform. And that's a really interesting challenge. Um, it's a challenge that I think Tableau are responding to when, when I do new feature videos. One of the things I'm always concerned about, and I have mentioned it before is, a lot of these you know, features seem like they need Salesforce. Einstein, for example, it's a whole product area. 
I just haven't gotten into because I don't know enough about Salesforce and it will take me a long time to get to the level that I feel comfortable sharing it with you. That said, on the other side, there are lots of Salesforce users who don't know enough about Tableau to kind of do the opposite journey. And so it's just going to take a while, I think, for that either concern to really be validated in terms of the features and capability or actually, um, you know, as people start to learn both platforms better, you might find that this, this sort of concern disappears. But it's great to see it here. Um, now, this point to me is also linked to the next point, but I'll just finish on this final bit here, which is um, alternatively, they will need to spend extra to get capabilities that belong to other product lines. Now that to me is a, is like a calling out to something that I've seen happen more and more, which is the add-ons that Tableau have introduced. The interesting thing with the add-ons is they used to advertise the price. Back in the day, they used to advertise the price of the add-ons full on front and center. What's happened recently is they've taken the price away from the website, which means there's no transparency on what the pricing is for these add-ons. And there's almost been sort of additional SKUs and add-on capabilities that sort of only exist when the customer approaches Tableau. And so I can't confidently sit here and say to you that I can build a matrix of all the different things that Tableau offer and how um, they're priced depending on your organization and size. I think Tableau is the only person that can do that. <laughs> There's no sort of a transparent sort of a tool. Um, a bit like with AWS, you get like a pricing calculator where you can go and toggle all the dials and it actually gives you a good estimate of what is involved. And it doesn't hide anything away from you. It literally tells you where the big ticket items are. We don't feel like we have that with Tableau. And so what people feel like is that they're being sort of nudged to spend extra to get the full capabilities of the platforms through add-ons. And so that add-on is not really reflected in the face value price that you see. Um, but again, we'll come back to that later. Now, this last point, serve on-premise clients. Tableau has a huge number of on-premise clients who use Tableau desktop and server. With the acquisition from Salesforce, the product portfolio has a clear direction to be cloud first or even cloud only. And I, I have to say, um, again, uh, Tableau server on-premise has reduced to only two updates a year. That means Tableau Cloud gets four updates a year. And what is interesting is that when Tableau market the updates for Tableau server, they market features previously released in a previous version as new in that version. And so if you're not careful and you're actually not looking out for it, you don't realize that in some cases, there are actually less features being developed for server only than there are for Tableau Cloud and server in, in sort of in general. And so that is something that is super interesting. I've done an analysis, an analysis at a Tableau user group before of just breaking down these features and sort of seeing where they're coming from. In that, in that sort of talk, I talked about actually the focus on web edit and because of this cloud to, uh, because of this focus to move to the cloud. The um, focus on web edit has also, you know, taken up a lot of airtime in terms of new capabilities, but they don't net represent any net new features, if that makes sense. So we're seeing this maybe play out a little bit more. Um, but that said, I, you know, Tableau still has a non-premise product and it's quite clear that they're desperately adding features to the cloud capability to make it more appealing. And they are moving customers over uh, to the cloud um, in, in large numbers. In fact, I think most new customers are probably starting off in the cloud. Uh, I can't remember where I'm getting this statistic from, but it was a public uh, setting, so I know I can share it. Um, at 1.75% of all new customers were going straight to the cloud rather than Tableau server. Um, and so, um, that is a super that is a super interesting sort of trend. And the thing is, is with the customers who start on Tableau Cloud, they don't know what they're missing on Tableau Server. It's only really the customers who are on Tableau Server who are trying to go to the cloud that realize they don't have certain feature sets. Um, and so that is also another interesting thing with the whole um, server to cloud migration. Um, people are finding out uh, real sort of big challenges, maybe late on in the day. And they're realizing they're losing capabilities, uh, even though, you know, the promise of the cloud is actually more expensive because it's managed by Tableau, but they're not necessarily getting the same feature set that they would have if they had a non-premise solution. So that is, a, again, another interesting uh, point to dig into. Um, this move to the cloud aligns with Salesforce's own product strategy. And I think Gartner's just calling that out. Um, every single, most products actually Salesforce have are cloud-focused tools. Um, 
And, you know, Gartner just calling out that this could impact existing clients who have no plan of moving to the cloud soon, i.e. If, if your organization is, you know, just weathering the storm a little bit in the economy and deciding to put off its cloud migration, um, yeah, maybe Tableau might get difficult for you, uh, according to this report. And so that's the Tableau section of the report. Now, the thing I'm always interested in is, you know, what do they say about Microsoft? So let me go ahead and find Microsoft, because uh, I think this is actually... Um, another interesting uh, area. So I think Microsoft is going to be further up. Let's go up and uh, I think this is it. Microsoft. Here you go. Microsoft is a leader in this magic quadrant. It's primary ABI platform. Power BI has massive market reach and momentum through Microsoft 365, Azure and Teams integration. And I have to say they're just straight up leading with it. Okay. Microsoft 365, which is a, a product you maybe even use personally, um, which is Office, Microsoft Word, all the, ho the whole lot, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, Notes, Outlook, all of that sits in Microsoft 365. Azure, which is the Microsoft Cloud capability that rivals things like AWS, and then Teams, which is the competitor to Slack. Um, those three things make it very hard for organizations to not use Power BI because those three things are heavily integrated into the Power BI platform. And so, um, you know, Gartner is quite right to point out that, look, these three things, which you already pay for, are probably driving your decision as to why you use Power BI. And actually, Power BI gets bundled into sort of those packages. And so, hey, yeah, you can see the, the, the strengths. The number one strength here is aligning with Microsoft 365 Teams in Azure. The inclusion of Power BI in Microsoft 365 E5 has provided an enormous channel for the platform spread. Essentially, by including it as part of another subscription, it's just opened the door um, to more users. And as a result of that, actually, um, you'll probably find that the skills of people using Power BI goes up. Um, Power BI as a tool will probably now get more attention and focus in terms of features and capability because more people are using it, more people are raising concerns. Um, and so, yeah, it's super interesting to see this, um, you know, move forward. The price and value combination, again, is a strength here. The Power BI service has now a um, now has a per user offering to appeal to small organizations with 300 or less. And um, Microsoft doesn't use a cross-selling strategy to increase revenue per customer like most other ABI platform vendors do. So because Microsoft is just a behemoth, it doesn't have to do any of this sort of messy stuff with pricing. It can just make it super simple and bundle it in with 365. A power portfolio and product ambition from Microsoft is very clear as well. So people people you know, think of Microsoft and they think yeah, Power BI is in safe hands here. Um, and some of the other capabilities with Power Automate and Power Apps as well are going to allow it to expand that sort of vision a lot, a lot more. And so that's a super interesting uh, kind of uh, analysis there. And then the cautions, government um, governance of content creation and publication limited headless open architecture azure is the only deployment option so of course because microsoft lean in heavily on microsoft capabilities um there's a little bit of a, a sort of a gap where you, you know companies can't lean to other governance and capabilities and where those capabilities don't exist you know the the support just isn't there within the platform and you can't really go anywhere else to get um the help um, limited headless open architecture. So let me let me read this a bit. While most Power BI services customers appreciate the tight integration with Microsoft, there's an increasing demand to see more interoperability across competitive BI platforms. In particular, as an analytics catalog and metric store, many Power BI customers would like to see more open headless integration with products competitive to Microsoft. So I think there's this idea in analytics that everything is becoming almost um, atomized. So um, why can't I use Tableau for my visualizations? Uh, use I don't know um, uh, Power BI for my you know data store and Power Automate for my automation. You know, people want to be able to plug and play different parts of the analytics stack because ultimately your data is the is the sort of common thing. So um, the platform should really work around your data rather than locking your data into the platform and stopping you from doing the things you want. And um, Gartner's calling out sort of some of that uh, challenge. Um, in the Tableau world, Tableau do a lot of this through APIs. So there's a lot of APIs that open up uh, Tableau um, to lots of different capabilities as well. So um, it's interesting to see this as a critique. And then lastly, Azure is the only deployment option. So Microsoft don't give customers the flexibility to choose a cloud uh, infrastructure as a service. IaaS is an infrastructure as a service offering. 
Um, while data connectivity enables multi-cloud and hybrid cloud scenarios, its Power BI service runs only in Azure. So the comparison here is that I can take Tableau Server and install it in AWS, or I could install it in Azure, or I can install it wherever I can get a server, essentially. There's no sort of tied down uh, capability where I install it. With Power BI, the service has to run in Azure. And that's probably why Microsoft are making this play. Look, if you want to run our software and you want to get it bundled in and free, we're going to ask you to increase your Azure expenditure. So whilst the product might be cheap, you probably might see an increase in your bills when it comes to how you handle Azure. So that's the Microsoft side. Now, again, I'll, I'll reiterate, I'm not an expert at this. Um, people with way more time and skills in terms of statistical analysis put, put this report together. But, it's, you know, it's got me thinking, like, this report mostly focuses in on, I guess, a, a leadership at a really high level, people thinking about the platforms. And once I said it represented the concerns of um, everyday users, I think more accurately with to do with the layoffs, to do with, um, you know, Salesforce's acquisition and potentially the innovation being Salesforce led. Um, what you don't ever see in the quadrant is actually an analysis of um, how the tool can how the tool could work better and what needs at a sort of micro level are not being met. And it made me think about maybe doing something different, maybe giving ourselves a challenge as a community over the next year to come up with our own variant of not necessarily the quadrant, but uh, a scorecard. And I got this idea from a podcast I follow, which is uh, called Upgrade. Upgrade is a technology podcast. I absolutely love it. And in that podcast, they do something called the um, annual report card. And the annual report card is done by a chap called Jason Snell. I'll put it image on it, of it on screen. Essentially, he sends out a survey to various people in the industry uh, asking them for their feedback about uh, Apple. And he gets a bunch of responses in and he goes through, sifts them and then summarizes them and then creates a report card and scores them. Essentially, everyone gets their scores in. And I think that could be a really good way of doing this as a community to kind of start getting our concerns about the actual, you know, on the ground experiences of using the product up against this kind of um, analysis because this kind of analysis focuses on the macro level challenges the purchasing decisions the strategic decisions i think there's also space for doing something that focuses on the more granular aspects so um i don't know what that will look like i'd love to know your uh, thoughts in the comments and um, yeah maybe we'll try and set something up over the next couple of months just to try and see if we can build something really interesting and the first one might be a very small sort of cohort, maybe a handful of people, but we'll start to sort of get this over time and maybe we'll start to build a picture and bring in more of a, a general analysis and a survey opportunity for everyone. Um, but anyway, I think I've talked for long enough. <laughs> that is the magic quadrant. Um, yeah, it's good to be back making videos again. I, I, had a, I had a short break after having some surgery for a couple of things, which I'll talk about some other time in the future. Nothing nefarious, but um, nonetheless, um, yeah, good to be back. I've got a couple more videos um, to do with uh, things I missed whilst whilst uh, I was away. Actually, the 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 next video is going to be about the um, little cool bits of innovation, which was actually coincidentally done at a Gartner event showing augmented reality with Tableau. I have a little bit of a sweet spot for augmented reality in, in myself, so I'll I'll try and touch on that video. And I dug into it, and I realized there's 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 a lot of new things in that video, but there's also some things that I don't think are as new as Tableau make it out to be. So wait for that video and you'll find out more. As ever, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.